my name is Ernest Anemone. I'm an attorney by trade. I like to say I'm an ethnobotanist by association. Uh, I co-teach a course, a couple of courses with John Dale Power, who you've uh, heard about today. We started off teaching a medicinal plants course, which we call medicinal plants from the sacred to the scientific. Uh, however, there was one medicinal plant in particular that we would get a lot of questions about, and I'm guessing by now you can figure out what it is. Uh, so we decided to uh, propose a course just on that. And we were thinking about what we should name it, and we wanted to just name it cannabis, because that made sense. Uh, but we didn't think that parents would go for that on their, their uh, children's transcripts, so we named it the Cannabis Debate, uh, which is the intersection of science, culture, and law. So that was the name of, of the course. So before we, uh, we get into all that, I was told that I shouldn't do this, but I went to the dispensary, and I got an edible that contains a psychoactive plant, and I wasn't allowed to bring cannabis, of course, but I was wondering who here would like to try an edible, a psychoactive plant? Anybody? One person? Oh, here you go. They're chocolate-covered raisins. The language that we use matters, and I do this with the class, of course, and uh, they're, uh, they don't believe that I've actually gone to the dispensary, uh, but I try to sell it as I have, and then when I tell them what I've actually brought them, it gets them thinking about how all knowledge claims are situated, which is a foundation of the class and the learning environment that we uh, create. And I think that this shouldn't be any surprise for any of the ethnobotanists here that this is the foundation of ethnobotany. The idea that all knowledge claims, even scientific claims, are situated in a particular perspective. Um, so it's very important that we interrogate our assumptions and our biases around the language that we use, um, the claims that we present, and we learn how to respectfully evaluate the assumptions and biases of other people as well. So, we usually begin class by some type of point of departure exercise, which would include asking broad philosophical questions like, what is medicine? What does it mean to be in good health? What is a medicinal plant? What is a scientific advance? Is practicing herbal medicine a political act? Um, these are broad philosophical questions that are meant to engage the students uh, in the subject matter in a way that they perhaps have never engaged in before. Because I love basil, you know, John does too. He likes harassing it in the lab. Uh, it increases the medicinal compounds. I just love to eat it. And I Dosage on that package so people are aware of how much they're taking. <laughs> Trish, I mean, you don't want to eat like a handful of these potentially from Colorado. We've had these kind of problems. So. Well, it seems to me that Trish thinks that I've actually brought a psycho. So I want to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's fair. If, uh, uh, if in fact that was cannabis or oh, what we yeah. traditionally call a psychoactive plant, but they are in fact Great. just chocolate covered raisins. Thank you. But. It's worth pointing out that even uh, uh, some people can have uh, adverse uh, but significant uh, uh, reactions to chocolate. So if you're allergic to chocolate or raisins, please don't eat chocolate covered raisins. <laughs> so we try to engage them in coming up with their own definitions. Now, what does it mean? And for me, you know, I remember my mother making a pesto sauce, and I remember talking about baseball, and I remember the smell coming from the kitchen, and I remember how relaxing that knowing that you know, in a few hours I would have this delicious meal. Uh, I, nobody was around to monitor it, but I'm sure my blood pressure went down and my heart rate went up and my mood was elevated by uh, you know, these wonderful smells and the act of uh, eating uh, this delicious meal that my mother prepared for me. Is that medicine? I don't know. I think it was. I mean, Western medicine tends to have its own definition. So we try to engage students in these really broad philosophical questions so that they can begin uh, to question what they're reading. So obviously if we're going to have a course about cannabis, uh, we need to talk about what actually is cannabis. Because there's been confusion for a long time. I mean, even the scientific uh, taxonomy um, has been rooted in controversy. So we can talk about uh, its characteristics, like trichomes and things like that. 
things that initially put it, and I don't think a lot of people know this, but was originally classified in brick ACA. Then it was moved to more ACA before it had its own family, now it's just kind of ACA. Uh, in terms of legal and social classification, the one thing that we know on the federal level about cannabis is, is that it's definitely 100% not a medicine. That's how we classify it. It has no medicinal value whatsoever. Does that make sense? Despite thousands of years of anecdotal evidence, at least, even uh, testimony from the American Medical Association. And then there's a folk taxonomy. So when we talk about folk taxonomy, um, we're talking about things like this. <clears throat> this is from Leafly, which uh, is a company that helps dispensaries market their brands and market uh, their products. And this is something that anybody who's familiar with cannabis is probably uh, used to seeing. You know, sativa indica. Sativa indica. You go to a dispensary and you ask them, I need something to help me sleep. And I'll tell you, oh, well, you want more of an indica. Or they'll say, you know, I want something that's going to help me, you know, stay awake, bright, exercise. Oh, yeah, you want a sativa. Or I want to be good because they had a sativa in the guy. This largely doesn't exist anymore. It's a fiction. Uh, we don't know what a, a true sativa is and what a true indica is. I mean, we're using botanical terms, but they're really just a marketing ploy. So one of the things that we uh, do in the class is we ask the students to engage in the readings by writing a weekly reflection. Uh, we ask them to reflect on the reading, what stood out to them, and develop questions uh, that they would like to discuss in class for it. We believe in a learner-guided approach. So overall, when we're talking about this, uh, this class, uh, I don't know how many people here are familiar with Paulo Freire, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But I use that personally as a litmus test for anything that I try to do. So Paulo Freire talked about you know, the banking model of education, which is this idea that the instructor has the superior information, and the students are just empty vessels waiting to be filled. Uh, they walk into the lecture hall, and then the instructor deposits his superior or her superior information into the heads of the students. Uh, we don't believe in that. Uh, we believe that is a, a bankrupt model of education. Uh, we favor the liberated model of education, which takes a learner-guided approach. And the only way to do that is to find out where they are with the material and engage them there. So this course overall is very much about meeting people where they are. Because if people want to learn about medicinal plants and their starting point is cannabis, that's where we want to engage them. And then when it comes in terms of engaging them with the material, we want to find out exactly where we need to be engaging them from there. Um, so we get interesting questions like, uh, you know, is money pouring in from uh, uh, private industry affecting uh, uh, the results, uh, the research results? How are medical professionals taught about cannabis as a drug uh, as a part of the standard curriculum? Uh, which is a question that's particularly near and dear to my heart because uh, I'm an instructor at several area medical schools, schools including Harvard University, uh, Tufts uh, Medical School, and Boston University Medical School, and it's something that's deeply lacking from the curriculum. People don't know how to talk about these things, and they think that if we don't have enough information, if we don't have 20, 30 years of clinical trials, then it's something that we're better off just not mentioning, or uh, saying something in passing about how well we don't know anything yet. But there are definitive things that we can say about it. We know, for instance, that it's highly variable. When we're talking about different strains, we're essentially talking about different medicines, as I'm sure Trish will uh, testify. Um, and that's important for uh, future doctors to know. And then we have a, a, a book called Cannabis Pharmacy, which was written by Michael Bacchus. Um, so if somebody said, what does Bacchus mean by the natural vigor of plants grown from the seed? Why does this not exist in clone plants? Which is a great uh, reflection in our science section, because that leads us into talking about the importance of biodiversity. Because in, in the field of cannabis, that's something that is uh, severely lacking these days. And it's disappearing quickly. So this is a principal component analysis of uh, three different strains that were, uh, that were created by this uh, company in the Netherlands called Bedrican. So you have Bedrican, which I guess is their flagship product, uh, Bedica and uh, Bedragonol. So you see how tightly packed in they are. 
These are essentially three different medicines, three different strains of cannabis. Now, when we're talking about what's sold in American dispensaries, you know, across the country now, we talk about white widow or amnesia, which are strain names. That's the principal component analysis for where they are all across the country. So when we're identifying things, it's very important to be precise. And this is one of the things that we, uh, we try to instill in them when we're talking about the science, in the science section of the course. Because if Vegetan, Vedica, and Pedravinol are essentially different medicines with vastly different effects, can you imagine what a medical patient buying amnesia or buying White Widow might experience traveling from dispensary to dispensary? So then we move into uh, the culture section of the class, uh, which talks about historical uses, um, anecdotal evidence. It's more of an anthology of uh, voices that we ask them to confront. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I do particularly like the first one, which is, I love the fact that Napoleon's soldiers brought back cannabis to France because they enjoyed the feeling of being intoxicated without being hung over. I guess I might have been able to kick it with these French guys. And then also maybe the last one, too. Dennis Perone used marijuana to create a safe haven for gays in San Francisco. Uh, he supported AIDS victims when the government did not. In one of the ways does marijuana legalization overlap with social justice? Which brings us to another important part of this class, which is understanding that none of this happens in vacuum, and that we often see the, the marijuana movement in this country nowadays, for I guess people who don't have long memories, as uh, being driven by the recreational market. Which, by and large, it is now, because that's where the money is. But the movement to legalize marijuana wasn't driven by recreation originally. It was driven by people looking to heal themselves, looking to save their lives and save the lives of others. The medical marijuana movement in America, in particular, was uh, in large part due to Dennis Perot and his work in San Francisco trying to address the AIDS crisis. And that was something that a lot of our students were surprised to, to learn. And we were happy that we could bring that bit of history uh, back to them. And then we get into the reasons for prohibition. <laughs> so this comes from uh, the Gore Files. If nobody's ever heard that term before, it was uh, um, Harry Anslinger, who was uh, the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and the number one um, evangelist, I would say, for, for uh, making Lead illegal and prosecuting people for it, not only prosecuting for it, but oppressing them for it, he uh, uh, amassed this collection of stories uh, where people, perhaps only incidentally, were using cannabis, but uh, they engaged in some type of violent crime. <laughs> Flash forward to modern day, which we have comments like uh, from this from Jeff Sessions. And then we go into the law section, um, where we talk about things like religious exemptions. We uh, talk about uh, things about uh, who is to determine what is a religion. And can anyone just go and use illegal drugs under a religious guise? And Church of uh, Cannabis uh, in Denver uh, perhaps uh, tried that. And then we also try to address the historical wrongs in this country, which are uh, you know, the war on drugs, which is international war on drugs. And then we ended the, uh, well, this was actually in the middle of the semester, we had a symposium called the Cannabis Debate, which uh, featured some uh, prominent figures in Massachusetts, including our newly elected uh, district attorney, um, a medical doctor who has been prescribing cannabis now for, for many years to thousands of patients, uh, a business owner, um, an anthropologist from uh, Tufts, uh, one of the commissioners from the Cannabis Control Commission, and John Dale Power representing the uh, chemistry side of things. Um, we were very proud that uh, the majority of the panel, uh, oh, and Dale, I'm sorry, she's cut off, but uh, Andrew James, who is an activist for incarcerated uh, families, incarcerated people and their families, uh, we were very proud that the majority of our panel was uh, women of color, uh, which by and large still to this day uh, their voices are being left out. And I'm just going to end the, uh, the presentation on this quote from Dennis Perron, which is, every cannabis user is a medical patient, whether they know it or not. And I'll just let you digest that.